morning, brethren. Good to see you. Glad that you're here. I know of many that will not be here today due to illness. And boy, our, certainly our thoughts go out with them. We have a lot that are not going to be here because they don't want to get sick. Uh, a lot of things going on in that area. And uh, we might have forgot to do this earlier. Although most of what we're going to be looking at is not really necessary on the PowerPoint, but wanted you to have it anyway. Uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 7 there, so if you'd like to go ahead and open your Bibles to Acts chapter 7, we're going to talk about a story where you probably heard, don't act like your father. Some of you mothers, I bet, have said that a time or two, uh, and we can say that jokingly, but in this instance, it's a real situation where, uh, you know, Whatsoever were written aforetime, Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And uh, as the noble British historian said, we learn from history that we don't learn from history, basically. We make the same mistakes over and over, it seems. Remember those, it's good to see Ed Troxel with us this morning. Ed's been going through some tests and things and trying to get medication squared away, and it's Good to see him to feel well enough to be out and about with us. Remember the Ritchie family, Robert in particular, just having all kinds of trouble. Alan is not here this morning as a result of his just, uh, you know, uh, problems, health problems, just not able to monitor and keep things uh, straight. And so he's not feeling well this morning. But I also wanted to make mention of Russell. Russell Ralston is very ill, and uh, he's going to uh, be going through... Uh, some procedures perhaps that, that can help with that, but uh, went by and spent some time with Russell yesterday, and it's just, uh, he's got a lot on his plate, so if you could remember the Ralston family, uh, but in particular, Russell uh, at this time, and uh, you know, one of the things uh, I, myself and Russell have enjoyed immensely giving each other about as much grief as is possible, and uh, you know, so when uh, difficulties arise and situations come up uh, you know I I still try to kid with him and uh, but uh, he's he's really got a road to hoe right now so if you could remember him and your prayers as well as those Carolyn uh, uh, is we're still recovering from her knee surgery and will be rehabbing that for a while and uh, certainly good to see the young lady walking in the door right now I was concerned about her she's here it's good to see Lucille always and remember uh, Wanda and David Williams as well, recovering from surgery. So we just got a whole bunch of walking wounded. And uh, so just be thoughtful uh, of everyone as best you can. Remember the Jackson family. And uh, we're, we're looking at here in uh, the story of Stephen actually begins in chapter 6 is where uh, we're going to run across him for the first time. Now, not saying these are deacons in, in Acts 6, but it certainly it looks as though they uh, are doing the work of. They're never called that, so I'm hesitant to call something that the Bible doesn't call something something, but it looks to me like they're, they're serving in a deacon capacity. And so what you have there is a situation where the Greek, Greek widows are not being ministered to, taken care of, like the Hellenists, I mean, the Hellenist Jews are not being taken care of. Hellenist women are not being taken care of like the Jewish widows. And so there's a problem. You know, hey, you don't love us. You know how feelings can get hurt over even the best of intentions, you know. Sometimes people can uh, just draw the wrong conclusion. Sometimes you can forget things. You know, uh, boy, I try when I mention somebody or something uh, like uh, Joe uh, Stewart having a birthday yesterday. You, uh, you know, you just want to make sure you don't miss anybody. Uh, Joe said I could have missed that probably but uh, you know we, we don't want to hurt people's feelings and so a lot of times people will like well he must not like me or they must not like me because they it's not that uh, you know it's just sometimes we can't remember everything and uh, so uh, you know that's one of the reasons we uh, sometimes uh, have problems and it's people think that something's being they don't love me or something of that nature when in reality it was just an oversight and that just happens you know so we find that happening here I believe in Acts chapter 6 did they not come on no those are nice looking screens though though aren't they uh, well, uh, it's, it's okay it's not really that much on the PowerPoint this morning anyway 
should have listened for that the first time. Anyway, you know, they say in speaking, you're supposed to move around to get your audience's attention. So that's what all this has been about. You think I just forgot to turn the PowerPoint on this morning. It's not. I'm getting eye contact with you. Hey, believe it or not, I used to be a mover. Then I came to South Pittsburgh. They say, look, at camera don't move. Stand there. Don't move. So I was like, okay, you know. So now we got a, a camera that'll pan a little bit. Anyway, you don't need to hear that. Acts chapter 6, people think they're getting their, you know, they're upset. Hey, why is this happening? And the apostles say, look, we've got other things to do besides wait tables. So notice what they do in verse 5. They come up with a solution. And so they, uh, verse 4, we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to ministry of the word. Verse 3, but you look out for some fellas that can take care of this. Seven men. Notice in verse 5 that uh, Stephen, a man full of faith, the Holy Ghost, is one of those, Philip, and then you have these other fellows named. But that's where we meet Stephen. And so he's going to be part of that work where they're taking care of those Grecian widows. But in verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. It says, Then arose a certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and the Cilicia, they're them of Cilicia and of Asia, and they're going to try to argue with Stephen. You don't argue with people who are inspired. It just doesn't work. They would try to argue with the Lord, didn't work. You're going to try to argue with Paul, won't work. You're going to try to argue with Stephen, won't work. You're going to lose, you know, because why? They have the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Sanctify them through thy truth, John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. These men are filled with the word. They have the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and whatever they speak, they don't even have to study because in the first century, that was one of the gifts, and Stephen has that gift. And notice verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So what are they going to do? They're going to attack him. <laughs> They're going to attack him. They're going to hire people. Suborned means uh, to throw in uh, stealthily. They're going to try to get men to come in and say bad things about him, how that he has spoken against Moses and against God. And they stir up the people. Boy, it's easy to stir people up, isn't it? You don't have to have truth. You don't even have to have a good lie. Just just keep saying it over and over and loud enough, and you'll get people to go yell with you. And they'll like, yeah, man, this ain't good. And they're like, what are we even yelling about? I don't know, but it's great, ain't it? Yell, yeah. And so that's what you have here. You've got some men don't have truth, don't have an argument. They have no case. And yet they're going to take him to the Supreme Court of Judaism, if you will. So uh, they go, they stir up the people, and they brought him to the council. Now that would be the Sanhedrin, those 70 we think of. And they set up false witnesses. That gives you the idea of these people's hearts. They could care less about truth. They're not interested in truth. They want their way. This is the way we've always done it. Well, since we've been alive anyway. See, they don't even know their own history. And that, they're fixing to get a history, leaven, a history lesson of all time. I mean, Stephen's going to lay it out for them, and you're not going to be able to miss it. And so they bring him in. They lie. They get people to lie. And so... Truth is not at consequence here. They could care less about it. And so they say, uh, these men say that he spoke against uh, Moses' law in the holy place. Uh, and said, for this we heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered. They never heard Jesus say anything of the such. They may have heard Jesus said, I have come, not, you know, not one jot, not one tittle of the law is not going to go fulfilled. I have come to fulfill the law. He didn't say he's going to change uh, Moses' customs, things of this nature, but the old law was going to end. It was going to be filled full. What it was for was done. And they sat in the council. Notice he sat steadily in, look in, the, in the council, looking steadily on him. They're looking at him. And saw his face as, as, as if it had been the face of an angel. I do not know what exactly that means, but I, I do know that it's hard for them to look at him and keep pointing that finger and, and being mad because he looks that he looks like a, a messenger. He looks like somebody who's at ease with himself. He looks like somebody who's confident. He looks like somebody who has their best interests in mind. And so sometimes it's it's hard to uh, be ugly. But what he's going to basically tell them here, he's going to go not really a, so much a defense as he's going to give an offense, and he's going to show them their history, and then he's going to tell them, "You're doing exactly Acts seven verse fifty one." You are doing exactly what your fathers did. Don't act like your daddy. Don't act like your fathers. 
for once in the history of this nation rise up and do what's right and the people is we will not have it so we want our way the thing that I like about this lesson and I, I wanted to talk about it was that it is the nature of man to move away from God's truth if God gave 10 laws let's just say there were 10 instead of the 630 there were in the Old Testament men are going to move away from those here they are do this the men are going to stand up and say well I went to Harvard or I went to Princeton or I went to I don't know Cincinnati School of the Blind for people that flunked out of the people that could see school whatever it is they're going to say I'm educated and I think that what God means here is this and they're going to change God's law and it's, when they're done with it you're not even going to be able to recognize it but they're going to say look we got a Bible hey we read that thing too just uh, this past Sunday our preacher stood up and he had a black book and he opened it up and he read a verse and he preached for two and a half hours on something that isn't true that people will leave the scriptures to do what they want to do that is the habit of man that's why Jeremiah would say seek ye the old paths seek and walk in his ways but what did the people say no no we're not going to do that we've got some other things that we want to do and so he is going to go back in their history and he is going to lay it out for them he says you've been like your fathers Stephen gives an offense uh, for his defense the charges are inaccurate they're they're not true and so he's not really even going to deal with what they're saying he is going to tell them what they need to hear notice he's going to give a, what we call a, an answer the word here for answer is apologia he's going to give an apology a defense and he's ready to give a defense brethren we have to be ready to give a defense when people ask us the various specific things that they will ask us about the church about salvation we need to be able to give them a thus saith the Lord the Bible says there is but one church the church is his body the body is the church Ephesians 1 22 and 23 Ephesians 4 verse 4 the saved are added to the church Acts 2 at verse 47 that's out of our hands God's taking care of that he says there's one he says the body is the church the church is the body there's only one you obey the gospel you become a member of it but we need to be able to show them and put their fingers on the passages so that they can see that for themselves that's a powerful tool because once people put their finger on the passage and see that God says and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved they're no longer arguing with me they're no longer arguing with you they're no longer fighting against me they're no longer fighting against history they are fighting against God because this is God's Word and most people that in our area have a reverence for the Bible and it's not something they're going to take up and do very easily they're going to think about that that's our job that's so in seed and that's what we want to do and that's what Stephen's going to be doing here I believe he has a five-fold argument there are those who say it's fourfold with a Jesus conclusion uh, I don't have a problem with that he's going to start off though and we're going to have a go ahead and take a look at this notice in chapter 7 verse 1 then says the high priest are these things so well you have to appreciate at least in the Jewish high court they would allow you to give a defense for yourself they would allow you to speak for yourself and that's what he's going to do notice he said men and brethren and fathers notice how he starts out you know we the people you know the preamble of the Constitution we the it, it we have something in common here if we can get our religious neighbors to open up the scriptures with us and realize look we're not fighting against the Bible here we're not fighting against God we're trying to see what God is saying to us men and brethren and fathers respectful not diving into a fight not hey listen here you yahoo nothing like that listen open the scriptures with me hear what I have to say we be in this together we are in this life together we were born into humanity God has placed us here for a reason and if we will come together in reason and look at what God has told us in the scriptures then we can come to a reasonable conclusion of what he's saying to us he says hearken the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham 
when he was in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Let me try that again. There's some things he's going to try to show here. And that is God is not just a God of Jerusalem. That God is not just a God of the Jews. But that the God of heaven is a God of all people. The law was given for a specific function. He's going to show them you didn't even keep that. But that's not the point. His point is God's a God of the whole world. Everybody in it. He says God spoke to Abraham. Not when Abraham's in the promised land. He's not in Canaan. He's over in Mesopotamia, which is you know part of Babylon, Chaldea area uh, later on. He speaks to him there in the Earl of Chaldees. Notice what he says. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran, which was from thence and with his father and so forth. And notice verse 5. And when he gave him none inheritance, none inheritance in it. God didn't give the land to Abraham. He gave Abraham a land promise. But remember, he told him, it's going to be a long time before you can enjoy the benefits of that land. As a matter of fact, you're going to have to go down into Egypt. You're going to be into bondage. Your people are going to be, not Abraham. And so Abraham, notice what he says here. He did not so much as set his foot on. Didn't give him any of it. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and his seed after him. As yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise that his seed should show should should sojourn in a strange land that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil for 400 years and the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge God says the reason you're going there is so I can show my power so I can show my, show my judgment and also not stated here is the fact that God says the iniquity of the Amorites to Abraham back in Genesis is not yet full I'm even going to give those people an opportunity to repent and change their ways. Well, uh, it says that Isaac, he, he has Isaac, beget Jacob and the 12 patriarchs. And then he's going to narrow his argument again. He's going to talk about Joseph, notice. And the patriarchs moved with envy. I, I love that they move. Here, they're going to reject what God, yeah, they're actually going to you know, work with God here, if you will, in an evil way. They're going to try to do something bad, but God's going to tell them later it was for good. And so, one thing I did skip, I should have gotten verse 8. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham begat Isaac and so forth. The covenant of circ circumcision, it was a pledge, a promise. And before, and here's the thing, before there was a holy place, the holy land, so to speak, uh, that people, you know, nowadays there is no holy land. All land's good to go. It'd be better if we rephrase that as the Bible lands. But before there was a holy land, there was a holy people and then there became a holy land if you will where the holy people lived uh, in God's people but now that holy place is, is the church there's a God is holy and wherever God is is going to be holy and that's the theme of what he's going to say here notice Joseph here the story of Joseph uh, verses 9 through 16 says the patriarchs moved with Andy sold, sold him into Egypt but God was with him where's he at he's in Egypt not in the promised land. Who's with him? God. God is active with Joseph in Egypt. Delivered him out of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Where's God doing all this work? Six times out of these eight verses, God's going to talk about Egypt. Egypt. That's where God's busy at right now. Because that's where his people are going. That's where one of them is. And he's going to bring the rest of his people there. And he's going to save Israel by taking them uh, to uh, Egypt. Notice uh, that we're going to talk about Joseph until he gets to, what is that? Uh, verse 17. Verse 17, we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about Moses. This is going to be the, the meat of his argument. Three 40 year periods of Moses' life. Moses lived 120 years, divide them up real easy. First 40 years, he's where? In Egypt. God blesses Moses in Egypt. Not in the Holy Land, but in Egypt. And then, after, remember, he thinks, hey, it's time for me to deliver my people. He slays the Egyptian who's, uh, you know, mistreating one of the Hebrew slaves. And what happens to him? You know, he has to leave. He has to leave, and he goes where? Midian. Midian is not 
in the Holy Land. As a matter of fact, it's, you know, out, out before you get the Holy Land from Egypt. Well, notice that um, what he says here, Pharaoh's daughter, of course, raises him. Verse 22, Moses learned all the wisdom of the Egyptians and mighty words and, and deeds. Uh, but when he came 40 years old, he, you know, verse 24, smote the Egyptian, has to leave. And so he goes into Median. And so in verse 29, fled, saying, I, I was a stranger in the land of Midian, and he begat two sons. And when he was there 40 years, there appeared unto him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord. We're not, in, we're not in the Holy Land. We're in Midian. And in the flame of fire in a bush. Remember? And Moses sees that. We just studied that not too long ago. And he goes back and he looks at it. And remember what God says to him? Verse 33. Take off your shoes. Why, Lord? Why should I take off my shoes? Well, he tells him. For the place where thou standest is the city of Jerusalem, God's land. No. No, he's a long ways from the promised land. He's standing on Mount Sinai, which, you know, the Sinai Peninsula. He's down in that Mount Horeb where the Ten Commandments are going to begin. He's a long way, but God says, where you're standing is holy ground. Why? Well, that's where God is. That's Stephen's point, that holiness is determined by where God is. It's not just this Temple Mount. It's not just Jerusalem. It's not just the Jews. This is salvation for all men, and it was necessary for the Christ to fulfill that law. They do not want to hear that. They are not happy with that at all. But notice this Moses brought them out. He's going to go in and deliver them. Verse 36, showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. Verse 37, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel. Now this is in the law of Moses. In Deuteronomy 18 at verse 15, the Bible says, And he shall raise up a prophet like unto me. Hear ye him. Prophet there is capitalized. King James translators want you to know that he's talking about, we, we're pretty sure this is messianic. And of course it is right here. Stephen's going to quote it. He's quoting what Moses said. Now, remember the Sanhedrin. They are the supreme court of their country. Just like our supreme court is in Washington, and they have a document that they base everything off of. At least they're supposed to. What do we call it? The Constitution. Okay? The Sanhedrin has a high court in Jerusalem. The Jews do in Jerusalem called the Sanhedrin. And they base everything off what? Their Constitution, which is what? The law of Moses. What did Moses say? God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. Hear ye him. If you don't listen to him. You are going to be condemned. And so, uh, him shall you hear at the end of verse 37. Verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received this lively oracles. The word given by angels, if you will. We have the Bible. That's how we got it. And notice, to whom our fathers, verse 39 to whom our fathers would not obey. What happened? They gave us the Old Testament. What did we do? Say we ain't going to obey it. Now they even made covenants. That's one of the tragic things you read about Israel. Swearing they're up on the mountain. Moses reading the law. And they're saying, well, amen, we're going to do that. We're right there. And boy, it ain't no time at all. They're not. When it gets even more specific, you get into the time of Ezra. You get into the time of Nehemiah. We're talking about people standing there right there saying, we're going to do exactly what God has to say. Boy, we're not going to leave the law. And it ain't five years later. They're marrying foreign women. They're bringing people into the land. They're intermingling with the nations round about them, things that God said not do. You can just go down the checklist. They said, we won't do that. We won't do that. We won't do that. We won't do that. And five, uh, ten years later, they did that. They did that. They did that. They did everything. They would not listen to God. Now, why say all this? Bring this over into a modern connotation Jesus says there is but one church men say thousands God says there is but one way into heaven my son men say many ways go any way you see fit God says do this men say no we're going to do that and then they want to say well God's going to approve of that God didn't approve of that then he doesn't approve of it now Notice, as a matter of fact, he says, 
to whom our fathers would not obey, verse 39, but thrust him from them, and their hearts turned back to Egypt. They didn't even want to go to the Holy Land. They said, we're good. We want to go back and eat some onions and some garlics and spices and the meats of Egypt. In fact, they said to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, we don't know what's become of him. And they made a golden calf and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Don't you know Henry VIII had to rejoice in the work of his hands when he established the Church of England? The Church of England here in America decided they'd change their name because it wasn't going over so good in the Revolution and all that. So they're now called the Episcopal Church today. But don't you know Henry VIII said, that's a great thing. Look what I did. I separated this from the paganism of Romanism. Well, <laughs> the paganism of Romanism wasn't right. You see what happened? People left Scripture and they can do anything they will. They made a calf in those days. Notice verse 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. I don't ask you to do this a whole lot, but I would appreciate it, and I think you'd get more of the lesson if you would turn in your Bibles to Amos chapter 5. We talk about this section in Amos chapter 5, beginning with verse 18. Uh, my section uh, in my Bible has let justice roll. We sing songs about this. It says, uh, for instance, the one that I think of the most when we talk about this is, uh, actually, let's back up from that a little bit. Hate the good, do the evil, and live. We talk about these things. Um, but the idea of the justice rolling, I want you to see what he has to say about, <clears throat> we talk about the lion and the bear. A man runs from a lion, he gets met by a bear, leans on the house of the wall, and a serpent bit him. Uh, you know, you have to be careful, but notice what he says. Verse 21, he says, I hate and despise your feast. Now, this is God's people. He commanded those feasts. But he says, I hate and despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the place of the offerings for your uh, fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, and I will not hear the melody of thy vials. He says, let judgment run down as waters. There's a song we sing just like that. And righteousness as a mighty stream. Verse 25, now he's going to get to the heart of the matter. He says, have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings? God says, have you offered those to me in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and your Kuin, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. What's he saying? You didn't offer those to me. You offered them up to those pagan gods that you were so enamored with. He says, therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Stephen quotes that and says, that's what that was all about. Written just like the prophets. You did that very thing. Notice in verse 43, he continues to talk about Moloch and Rephidim, the figures they made to worship. And I will carry you away into Babylon. Now in verse 44, he says, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness. So here, he's going to switch over to David now. He had the tabernacle. Remember, this is what God told Moses. He gave him the exact pattern on how to build it. But they were going to do it differently. They, they built a temple. David wants to build a temple. God allows David to do that. Notice verse 46, talking about David, says, Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle, or to, uh, desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob? But, you know, of course, David's not allowed to do that. Being a man of war, Solomon builds it. Solomon built him a house. But what does, what does Stephen do with that? Stephen quotes from 1 Kings, and he says, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the Lord. This is a quote from Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is this place of my rest? Hath not my hands made all these things? So in his four arguments there, how the people have uh, rejected God, would not listen to God, notice how he's going to bring that into 51. I used to think when I first started reading this passage years ago that somebody must have interrupted him or something, you know, they, they, they yelled something out, you know, ugly or something. 
And so he just changed what he was saying and started up with something else. This is actually the conclusion of it. This is what he's been trying to get to. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. He says, you haven't listened. We as a people have not listened. That's one of the great things about the prophets of old. You think of Ezra, uh, you think of Ezra 9, you think of Daniel 9. Both times those great men give this long prayer of repentance for the nation, but they also throw themselves in there. And Stephen would have put himself right there as well. He would have said, we as a people have not listened to God. We've always done what we wanted to do. This is one time we need to change that, if you will. We need to see what's done. Notice it's which of the prophets have not your fathers, our fathers, persecuted. You can't name one. You can't name a prophet of old who was not given a hard time and in some cases slain. And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one. What were the prophets doing? Pointing toward the Christ. Jesus is coming. The Christ is coming. Emmanuel. God is with us. And now he says the just one. He's, this is going to be a statement emphasizing that. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. He said you're following in the same footsteps as your daddies, your fathers. At some point in time you have to break the cycle. That's what restoration is all about. That's what gospel preaching is all about. It's to bring people back to the Word of God. That's what your mission is. That's what my mission is. <clears throat> to help people see the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus and that when we do what God says, we become what God says we become, not what some men may label us. We don't become something different than this fellow over here who did the same thing and obeyed the same gospel. We're the same if we obey the same gospel. We're the same people. You don't have this government and that government. I'm talking about church government, not political government. You don't have elders over here and a board of deacons over there and a bishop over there and a pope over there and a council over there and a synod over there. You don't have any of that. You have what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? Jesus is the head of his church, and he has given that authority to local elders. Local leaders, presbyters, elders, pastors, in the sense of the men qualified in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And you have no right to deviate from that or you leave God. He says, we're just not in the habit of doing that. We've been stiff-necked. We've been uncircumcised in heart and ears. We won't listen. When God says do this, we say, well, that's a pretty good idea, but wouldn't this be better? And surely God would want us to do this instead of that. No, he says, don't do that. He said, you killed the Christ, the just one. You've been betrayers and murderers. Verse 53, who have received the law by the dispens disposition <clears throat> of, angel of angels. What's he saying? The old law was given by angel. You got it by the disposition of angels, Mount Sinai. But the point is, the, the major thrust of that, and have not kept it. You haven't kept the law. You want to talk about the law? You want to be a justice of the law? You want to be a part of the Sanhedrin? You want to be a Pharisee? You want to be somebody who knows the law inside and outside, but you have not kept the law? Well, that's all they can't take anymore. They heard these things. They were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth. When he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopping their ears, ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. Capital punishment for telling them the truth. It's no different than they had done the prophets before. And it was no different than they did our Lord. These were God's people. The lesson here is God's people are prone to leave the truth. God's people are prone to not do what God would have them to do. Hence the stress on going back, seeking the old paths, doing what God would have us to do in the way that God would have us to do it. 
And constantly, as the ship is sailing, we have to make corrections and come back to the Word. It's the tendency of man to lean to the right. It's the tendency of man to lean to the left. God says, stay in the middle. And when you find yourself going off this way, come back. You find yourself going off that way, come back. Come back to the Word of God. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Chapter 8, verse 1, there's a young man there who's going to be a, take a prominent role. As a matter of fact, not this quarter, but next quarter in our adult class on Sunday mornings, we'll be talking about Paul in the book of Acts. Who's Paul? Well, he's Saul here from chapter 8, verse 1. If you think of the example, here's a man, Stephen, who lived like Jesus, who preached like Jesus, who died like Jesus. You might say, well, what, what good? You know, that, that's terrible. I can't believe that. We may be, think, you know, oh, man, poor Stephen. No, not so. If so, you missed the whole point. What we need to be saying is, Poor Israel. They didn't listen to the word of God. They didn't make the corrections. They did as so many have done. They killed the messenger. Augustine, by the way, we've been saying that wrong. Isn't that great? It's Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, about a 4th century theologian, said, and I believe it's very, very, uh, very accurate, the church owes Paul and boy, don't we owe a lot to the idea that we have of Paul. The whole last half of the book of Acts, Romans through Philemon, and I'm thinking probably Hebrews as well, but a great portion of the New Testament came from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Augustine says the church owes Paul through the prayer of Stephen. Notice Saul standing right there, and he's not only, uh, you know, watching it, but he's an active participant in the fact that he's like, go get them, guys. Wipe out that sect, S-E-C-T. Wipe them out. We need to get back to the God of heaven, which is the very thing that Stephen's been trying to preach and to teach with this sermon. With this, with this, the beatings that start in Acts chapter 5 go capital. They go into murder. And so as a result, the disciples have to go everywhere. And as they go, what do they do? They, they preach the gospel. Don't you know that as Paul obeyed the gospel and became an evangelist, uh, don't you know when he was cold, don't you know he was out there floating on pieces of board where one of the shipwrecks he'd been involved, don't you know when he was having the stripes laid to his back with those rods that he couldn't think back and see Stephen as he was having the life literally beat out of him with rocks. Say, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And draw strength and comfort from that fact. Knowing that just like those Jews who were killing Stephen, Paul was right there. And that probably helped him, I think, a lot to go through that pain and agony and go through those situations thinking, these people are just doing this out of ignorance, just like I did. One thing, brethren, that we need to do is take a lesson like this. Learn that we don't learn these lessons. And be ever vigilant. To do things the way that the early church did. Don't look at the innovations that are going so rampant upon among even those of our own of our own people. And constantly look what we're doing and weigh that by the word of God. If we do that, if we stick with the word of God, we're gonna be just fine. We'll be just fine. If you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel. Over and over again, you see the same situation happen. People come to an understanding of the truth by hearing it, by reading it. Based upon that, they learn that they're to confess to Christ before men, having repented or changed the way they're living their lives. And it's culminated in their salvation when they have the circumcision not made with hands. The baptism, baptism in water for the remission of your sins, where you're not doing the work. We're going to talk about that tonight when we talk about grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we're not working our way to heaven. Nobody does any work in baptism except the guy who's putting you in the water. And then when you're in the water, God, who's doing the operation of washing away your sins and raised to walk in newness of life, you're not working your way to heaven with that. That's a terrible thing that people have tried to uh, use 
to accuse God of saying that his plan uh, somehow is working your way to heaven. We're simply submitting to what God would have us to do. You need to do that. If in times past you have, you left your first love. Like these Jews of old, you, you love God, you meant to do well, but you just found yourself doing something you ought not to be doing, then confess that. Come back home. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.